There was a 19-year-old Korean girl named Haruku who was attending university in a large city. One night, she had to stay late in the library to finish a project and it was almost dark by the time she returned home. Haruku lived on the 14th floor of an old apartment building. She stood in the entrance and pressed the button to call the elevator. She always hated coming home alone so late in the evening. It just didn't feel safe. When the elevator came, she stepped inside and pushed the button for her floor. Just as the doors were about to close, a handsome man came running up. The man was out of breath and put his hand to stop the elevator doors closing. Then, he stepped into the elevator and stood beside her. You live on the 14th floor? he asked, seeing the button lit up. Yes, replied Haruku. Oh, said the man, smiling. I live on the 13th. As the elevator ascended, he pressed the button for 13. Through the windows in the elevator door, Haruku watched the floors go by as they both stood in silence. She stole a few glances at the man. He certainly was handsome. She always wondered if he was ever going to be interested in dating her. When he happened to look at her, she battered her eyelids and smiled sweetly at him. Just then, the elevator stopped at the 13th floor. The doors opened and the man stepped out. See you later, he said. Yes, see you, replied Haruku. As the doors of the elevator were closing behind him, the man suddenly turned around, pulled a sharp knight out of his jacket, and said in a menacing voice, Upstairs! Then, laughing like a maniac, he ran towards the staircase. The girl was terrified, but before she could do a thing, the door shut and the elevator began to ascend. She began to panic. Desperately, she hammered the buttons with her fist, trying to get the elevator to stop, but it was no use. When it reached the 14th floor and the doors opened, the man with the knife was already standing there, waiting for her. In Korea, people say that this is a true story. The girl was found dead, stabbed to death in the elevator. People say that the worst part was not her death itself, but rather the sheer horror she experienced in between those two floors when she was trapped in the elevator and knew she was going to die. They claim that this is the reason that all elevators now have a stop button. Wendell was a panhandler near my college. I always gave him my change when I had extra. Usually, I keep a hard rule not to give money to individuals because I give it to known local charities instead, where I can be sure the money is going to a specific cause. This one panhandler, though, he always sang opera music, quite beautifully, all things considered. Even though it was clear he was begging for money due to poverty and homelessness, not busking for tips, I always thought it was admirable that he was trying to perform a service in exchange for the money, and I don't like carrying coins, so I gave what I could. It wasn't much, barely a dollar each time. I would occasionally strike up conversations with Wendell even if I didn't have any money for him. He liked to make students laugh with funny impressions or jokes, and he was a bit older. I'm an undergrad, and he was probably 40s to 50s. So, we'd mostly have quick chats about the news, or the weather, or whatever, nothing deep. Sometimes, he'd randomly share something so intimate that I'd feel obligated to reciprocate with something at least superficially personal. Example, he'd blurt out that he almost went to college on a baseball scholarship, but drugs ruined everything. And I'd be like, oh, wow, I'm sorry to hear that. I play volleyball, not for scholarship though, so um, see you around, okay? Once, Wendell called me over while I was walking with a professor or my advisor, and I didn't want to be rude, so I went over just to say a quick hello and introduced my advisor. When we walked away, 
My advisor was pretty clearly horrified I asked why Wendell knew me by name. I explained our little friendship, and he said the homeless in the city weren't like the homeless in my smaller town back home. I figured he was being elitist, and I think he could tell that I hadn't taken him seriously because after we dropped the subject, just before I left, he reiterated that I shouldn't forge friendships with the homeless population in the city or even give them money because the chronically homeless, you know, the ones on the streets, enough that you could get to know them, tended to have a criminal or addictive histories. I was surprised because my advisor is usually pretty progressive and compassionate, so I appealed to him with, Wendell is a victim of a post-capitalist society and all the other things I'd learned in his very own classes, but he wasn't having any of it, basically saying however Wendell became chronically homeless, now he was and I should act accordingly. So my professor strongly implored me not to continue even talking to Wendell at all. I kind of shook my head thinking, well, okay, boomer. And if anything, felt fortified by the warning. Like it was a confirmation that I was radically doing the right thing. Leading a new path, breaking down barriers, bettering society. I got closer to Wendell and shared more about my life with him. But the very next time I talked to Wendell, he was really irritable and distant, and I wasn't sure why, until he said, So your boyfriend, you two live together, or what? And I had no idea what he was talking about, and I said, What boyfriend? And he said, The guy I met from yesterday, you were walking down the street with him. I laughed explaining it wasn't my boyfriend and it was just my academic advisor. Then all of a sudden, he wasn't irritable anymore. He was as chatty as he'd ever been. I probably should have taken that as a red flag, but I didn't think about Wendell much at all then. I only saw him once or twice a week and only for a few minutes. It was around then that Wendell started bringing me gifts. I'd pass him, and he'd have a flower for me or a metal machine piece. I never refused because I figured it was a means of preserving his dignity when accepting money, like with his opera singing. One of my roommates did remark on the flower once, and when I explained, she said it was weird. I thought she was also being elitist and that I was enlightened, bridging the class divide and superior to her neoliberal paranoia. I mean, come on, it, it was just a flower. My advisor clocked all this so brought it up with me again a while later, saying he was worried I was being manipulated. I tried to tell him about Wendell's opera singing and impressions and how he even almost went to college, but then I remembered the reason he lost his baseball scholarship and I stopped short. Looking at it through the lens kind of made me reconsider the whole thing. I thought about what my professor had said, sparing the details. We did talk for like half an hour and I finally connected the dots that Wendell did have a history of drug use and he did sometimes mention how a previous girlfriend overreacting to something he'd done had derailed his life besides the drugs. So I decided... Maybe I should think about distancing myself a little. But very shortly after the pandemic hit and classes went virtual, so to save on rent, I went home to my parents' house, still in the state but not near campus at all. About three weeks into being home, I was watching a friend's Insta story when I heard Wendell singing opera in the background and I thought, Ah, oh, I forgot all about him. Hope he's doing alright. And that was that, and I kept watching different stories. Later that night, something about the story kind of stuck in my gut. It had popped into my mind a few times subconsciously, and I'd ignored it, but it kept coming back. So I decided to go and watch it again. That's when I realized my friend's video wasn't from our college town. 
It was from my much smaller hometown, which is nowhere near my college. That freaked me out a little, but I figured everyone moved around with the pandemic hit. My town isn't that small. It isn't that far from the college. It was probably a coincidence. I really wanted to mention it to my parents, but they had always warned me against talking to homeless people. Besides, like, can I buy you a meal or something? So I felt too embarrassed to explain the situation to them. Especially since it was probably a coincidence and I would sound so conceited if I were like, yep, he definitely followed me because aren't I just so great that he's probably obsessed with me? We have a type 1 diabetic in the family, so we took quarantining very seriously. I figured I'll never see him anyways. I'm not going out anytime soon, so it doesn't matter where he is. And nothing happened. Well, one thing. A girl from my high school who also ended up at my college called me and in summary said, This is going to sound really weird, but I feel like I should say something. I was downtown and a beggar asked me about you, like specifically you. He knew you were on club volleyball, he knew your major, I didn't tell him anything, but I thought you should know. I was pretty alarmed at first, because how would he know I was this girl? But once we talked about I learned she'd been wearing a sweatshirt from our college, so I thought about it and decided he probably saw the sweatshirt, figured she might know me from college since we were both from this town and was just trying to find out who and was just trying to find out how I was doing. I thought it was sweet. Also, a little weird, but he was a little weird, that was the part of his charm. I thanked her, but told her not to worry about it. Besides, I wasn't in town much longer anyways. I have decided to go live back near campus. It was impossible to get my coursework done with my whole family around all day. And so, I went back to campus a while later. I didn't think about Wendell at all, until... I saw him back on the same corner just a week after I returned to campus. Okay, even I knew at that time that something was wrong. I stopped giving him money, stopped talking to him, but I was so humiliated by how high and mighty I had been insisting that nothing was wrong and everyone else was being paranoid and elitist that I decided not to tell anyone what I had noticed. I was already barely leaving my apartment, never going on campus, and his usual spot was right by campus. I felt bad about potentially hurting his feelings or reading too far into the situation, but I figured he'd get the message and better safe than sorry, right? After finals, I decided to visit my brother in a different state. His roommate had moved home, leaving an extra bed. So I drove up to his place to celebrate the end of the year and get away from it all. About the ninth day in, I was woken up way earlier than usual. When my brother isn't working or in school, he sleeps until noon. And to the sound of my brother talking at the door, I got up to see what was going on, but we weren't seeing anyone. We stayed totally quarantined and his state was being hit hard. My brother was talking nicely to someone outside through a crack in the door, but when he turned, he looked royally pissed at me. He turned back outside and said, hold on here, closed the door despite the other guy protesting, but I couldn't hear what he said exactly. My brother immediately got in my face and whisper yelling said, mom and dad are gonna kill you. I had no idea what he was talking about. But my first thought was the cops had come to arrest me for something. It was the only logical thought I could generate first thing in the morning. The only thing I could imagine being arrested for my fake ID, which I only even used to get into concerts and obviously none lately. So I was really in shock. But my brother was still going on. As best as I can remember, because I was panicked at this point, 
He was saying, and I'm gonna kill you. This is so not cool. You didn't even ask? Well, I wouldn't have said anyways. But you didn't even think to ask? I realized that didn't align with being arrested. So finally, I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, you're dating a 40-year-old guy? Older? 45 maybe? Of all the people out there, I mean, <laughs> Jesus, dad's gonna kill you and then have a heart attack and die, which will kill mom. And you invited him to my house while we're supposed to be socially distanced? You two can go to a hotel because he isn't coming in here. I wasn't a dick to him out of respect for you, but if he doesn't leave now, that's gonna change. So I had no idea what he was talking about. None. I hadn't connected any of the pieces yet because you've got to remember, Wendell was such a small part of my life until this point, I almost never saw him or thought about him. And my whole world had been turned upside down by a pandemic in the preceding few months. He was background noise, faint background noise, compared to all the other stuff I had going on. So I just said the first thing that came to my mind. Dude, I don't know why you're getting so mad at me. I don't have a boyfriend and I don't know what you're talking about. Someone's got the wrong house. My brother looked like he was ready to rip my face off. He said, We're adults. Come on, don't fucking lie to me. I'm not mom and dad and we can't deal with this if you're going to lie to my face. And I said I wasn't lying. And I think he could tell from my expression and tone that I genuinely was serious. So now he was as confused and irritated as I was and he was like, he didn't just vaguely say he was here for his girlfriend. He used your name. He rattled off a ton of very exact info. I think he said you, uh, yeah, he said you guys had a fight and he was here to work things out. Now, I've been looking for a boyfriend for a long time, so I was half thinking, huh? Maybe dreams do come true. Might as well see who it is. But I was also starting to feel a bit sick in my pit of my stomach because it would be one thing if this happened on campus or back home. But I had changed states. My brother moved to this state for school and I don't know anyone here but him and his friends. So I finally did the obvious thing and looked through the peephole. I almost didn't recognize him at first. He had showered, shaved, and changed into clean clothes for the first time since I've known him. But sure as shit, it was Wendell. It was Wendell standing on my brother's doorstep, hundreds of miles from his original corner. I was so scared I couldn't speak. My heart was pounding like I was slipping under deep water with my legs tied. I just backed away from the door and sat down on the couch and tried to collect myself. My brother thought this was my affirming that there was really some secret older boyfriend who had just made himself known, so I took a minute for him to cut off his ranting and his dramatic, what will grandma think, stuff. Finally, he realized I was tearing up and he sat down, calmed down, and apologized and said, we'd figure it out, and I whispered still out of breath, no, you don't understand, he followed me here. My brother still didn't get it. What? You didn't want him to come here? What was your fight about? He asked, still thinking the guy was my boyfriend. I managed to repress my panic enough to explain the broad strokes of him, but I don't think he fully grasped how creepy it was in the moment because he was like, you're shitting me, that's hilarious, I'll take care of this. He went to the door and called from behind it. Yo, just check, she's not here. Must have packed out this morning, you should do the same. I'm taking this social distancing real serious and winked at me. That's when, as my brother says, when he tells this story that it got real. Wendell said, you're lying. I heard her in there. Tell her I'm sorry, I don't know why she's been avoiding me, but I got cleaned up for her and I'll take her anywhere she wants to go. Tell her that, tell her, and don't lie. I'll know if you lie. That rubbed my brother the wrong way and he said back, Bro, you're not taking her anywhere. 
Now get off my deck before we have a problem. And Wendell sounded like he was walking away, but instead, he was going over to the window. When I saw him staring, he looked different than I'd ever seen him. Even in a few seconds earlier when I'd glanced through the peephole, his clothes were clean, but they didn't fit or match. Eyes bugged out of his head, white stuff caked on the corners of his mouth, and I hadn't noticed at first. Shaking, just kind of disconnected from reality. He started banging on the window, shouting things like, That's my girlfriend! You can't keep her in there, you little bitch ass! Let her out, you bitch ass! Let her out! Let her out! I'm coming, baby! I'm coming! I couldn't tell if it was meant as a threat or a reassurance. I was so scared. I was too scared to run or even move. I think my brother was almost surprised by the sudden outburst. He was rolling up his sleeves like he was preparing to go out there, and I was trying to make my voice work to beg him not to. But I was so anxious, scared, embarrassed, and sad that I had missed all the signs leading up to this, all the opportunities to prevent it, that our friendship was never the wholesome thing I thought it was, and had so many thoughts swirling in my head fear being chief among them. All I could do was scream, not words, just a scream, and I cover my ears to drown the whole situation out. Before my brother could charge out the door, well, he's an athletic guy, but I don't think he's ever actually been in a physical fight, Wendell punched through the window. Nothing actually happened when he punched through, and there was an eerie moment of silence where nobody moved. I think even I stopped screaming, but when he pulled his hand back, all hell broke loose. A fair amount of blood started spurting out when he pulled his hand back through the glass. The things he was shouting started to make even more or less sense along the lines of, Look what you did to me! This is a test! I told you I couldn't be stopped, bitch ass! And the look in his eyes got even more distant. I think the sight of blood which has always made my brother really squeamish, made him realize this was real. And he finally yelled, Damn it, sis! Call 911! While he leaned against the door, which Wendell was now repeatedly running into. I don't even remember making the call, but apparently I did, because within 10 minutes, the police arrested Wendell without resistance. He kept trying to tell them his girlfriend was trapped in the house and he'd come all this way to save her. My poor brother was even momentarily handcuffed and had to explain he hadn't taken me hostage. Probably one of the most haunting memories of the whole event is, as they carted Wendell away for a rest, he started singing opera music. I've learned a lot of important common sense and life lessons from this saga, but most of all, Wendell Let's not meet. A young woman was walking down the street when she saw an old blind man coming towards her. He was stooped over and wore dark glasses and a cane. He seemed to be having trouble walking and when he was passing by her, he almost fell over. She grabbed his arm and steadied him and he thanked her for her kindness. Then he asked the young woman if she could do a favor for him. Could you please deliver this letter for me? The blind man said. I'm old and disabled and I have a terrible time finding my way around the city. Being a nice person, the girl agreed to help him and he handed her a letter with an address scrawled on the front. As the young woman turned to walk away, she happened to glance back and saw the blind man walking down the street quite quickly with his cane tucked under his arm. Then, to her surprise, the blind man took off his dark glasses and casually tossed them into a garbage can. Suspicious, the woman took the envelope to a nearby police station. The police went to the address on the letter, which turned out to be a butcher shop owned by an old couple. All seemed perfectly ordinary until the police asked the old couple to open up the large refrigerator in the back of the shop. The old couple refused, so the police had to break it open themselves. Inside, they were confronted by a horrible scene. 
There were dead bodies strung up on meat hooks and shelves stacked high with chunks of human flesh. Until now, the police had overlooked the letter which the mysterious blind man had given to the woman. When they opened the envelope, a piece of paper inside contained one chilling line. This is the last one I'm sending you today. Hi everyone, it's your older sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. For today's episode, we have three stories, and two of those are read by a very good friend of mine, Just Plain Creepy. His link is in my description, and do check him out and show him some love. He's actually pretty awesome. If you want me to read a story, or if you want to follow my social media, the links and the email are found in the description of the video. And don't forget to like, leave a comment, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click on that notification bell so that you would know when I upload another video. Again, thank you for watching.